So I would like to review some diagnostic considerations, mm -hmm. then talk a little bit about um, complications of endocarditis and things to, to watch out for clinically. And finally, um, I'd like to talk about strategies uh, for patients and evidence um, for treating patients who are at high risk of complications with guideline-based medical or surgical therapies. Um, so the first point I'd like to make is that, that endocarditis usually isn't that easy to diagnose, okay? Um, in 2007, Senate looked at about 800 patients with bacteremia as a Tampa general. Sixty, some of them had endocarditis, and the average one had seen four outpatient physicians. Uh, before getting diagnosed. These were more, this was a more subacute population. And of course, um, uh, every day that these patients went increased the, uh, the risk of complications. So only in about 11 percent of patients are you going to see, according to a, this was a 2014 paper in JAMA Dermatology, only 11 percent of 500 patients had any skin manifestations at all. And even though I was always taught to look for a subconjunctival hemorrhage, this happened in one out of 200 patients with endocarditis. So I'm sure that these findings were more common um, in an era when uh, it took longer to treat bacteremia, or especially in the pre-antibiotic era, almost everyone probably developed these by the time they passed. Um, but in 2015, we really can't rely on our exam to diagnose endocarditis in bacteremic patients. Um, so the echo is, is really the mainstay of diagnosis, and this, this is, of course, showing a big regurgitant jet. Um, and one of the most common ID consults we get appropriately um, is from management of bacteremic patients. This is especially important in Staph aureus bacteremia, where there's actually evidence for a mortality benefit of getting an ID consult, and it, it probably should be mandatory. Um, and almost everybody with a Staph aureus bacteremia is going to wind up with some sort of echo. Um, but we very often find ourselves debating whether or not to get the TEE. Um, so uh, Tom Holland and Vance Fowler at Duke did, did a uh, systematic review <coughs> Of 4,000 patients uh, with Staph aureus bacteremia, and not surprisingly, the TEE uh, was more sensitive. So they di diagnosed by TEE anywhere between 14 and 28 percent over the nine trials, compared to 2 to 15 percent with TTE. So overall, um, you know, if you do the subtraction, 15 to 20 percent of patients are, are going to get diagnosed by a TEE that would have been missed. Uh, with just a surface echo. Now, of course, the negative pre predictive value, though, of the surface echo depends on um, your pretest probability or the, the uh, population prevalence of endocarditis. And so, in patients um, who met all of these criteria, you, they concluded you could avoid a TEE. But to get a negative predictive value of between 93 and 100 percent, for a surface echo, you had to have no permanent intracardiac hardware. The blood cultures had to sterilize within four days, which makes sense. They couldn't be dialysis patients. They had to get it nosocomially, so they couldn't come in bacteremic with Staph aureus. There had to be no secondary foci of infection, and they couldn't have any uh, stigmata of endocarditis or a new regurgitant murmur, basically none of the minor <coughs> criteria. So. Um, you might guess most of our patients, if you follow this, are going to wind up with uh, a transesophageal echo if, you, if you're going to follow uh, the recommendations of this particular study. Uh, one exception might be uh, patients who are going to get prolonged antibiotics anyway. Uh, but the patient who doesn't need uh, a TE would be, say, somebody who's otherwise doesn't have any, doesn't have dialysis, doesn't have a valve, you know, got, got line sepsis, and you were able to pull the line and, and you treated them. Um, but in general, this makes me feel a lot bad about some, about some of the uh, 
negative TEs that I've gotten. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, organisms uh, causing uh, uh, endocarditis on Friday, so I won't go over too much of the classification and the various um, uh, differences in mortality risk. Of course, uh, strep is sort of the lowest mortality. Staph is sort of in the middle, and then enterococcus and gram-negative rods are higher. Staph is becoming more common, although there was a very interesting um, paper that I won't go into in much depth here, suggesting that the Vanco MIC actually was not correlated well with, um, with mortality, although most of those patients still had an MIC less than one in the paper. Uh, but basically all of these are sticky bugs, and what are they sticking to? Well, this is a normal valve um, with sort of a nice, fairly smooth looking epithelium. Um, and this is a valve with, uh, this is a mitral valve that has regurge. And you can see where the turbulent flow has sheared off a lot of the epithelium, leaving exposed areas for bacteria to stick. Um, and many patients with mitral valve prolapse actually also have um, some platelet dysfunction that goes with it, and so you get, you get thrombus uh, sticking to these areas, and then um, just sort of more surface area for these bugs to, to stick. And of course, prosthetic valves um, provide a tempting source for, for anything. Just even some of the less sticky organisms love, uh, you know, these prosthetic valves. And to the, um, to the right of the slide, you see a perivalvular abscess there, with sort of eaten through the valve. And so I never forget seeing the echo of one of my actually unfortunate patients who wound up in hospice. You could see the regurgitant jet, not through the valve, she had a regurgitant murmur, but the, reg the regurg was happening all around the valve. Um, so in general, a regurgitant murmur with a prosthetic valve is, a, is an ominous sign. Um, and as I said, she did go to hospice. Other... Um, Lab things to look for. The thing that I found helpful is, um, uh, especially is microscopic hematuria, um, especially in a patient who has some echo findings, like maybe a, uh, they got an echo for another reason. It was, it was a consult I've sometimes gotten, and somebody saw something that may or may not be a veg, and uh, microscopic hematuria uh, and proteinuria, but evidence of renal involvement, evidence that that something is being flipped off this valve can sometimes be useful. Um, so even with uh, early and appropriate management, complications uh, do develop. Um, in the heart itself, you see valve perforation and, and incompetence, uh, rupture of the chordae tendinae, which is separate from what you see in an MI where the papillary muscle itself ruptures, um, effusions, infarctions. Um, and of course, failure, uh, as well as renal manifestations. So here, you'll, you'll see a perivalvular abscess. That ruler should not be able to go through there. Um, and the next slide is uh, an unfortunate patient who died of pericarditis. And here's the close-up where the bacteria have just invaded all through the, uh, the heart muscle itself. Um, can anyone tell what, what happened here? <clears throat> so yeah, the the yeah, well, the aortic valve had a, had large vegetations which flicked off the valve and into the the ostium of the coronaries and occluded right and left coronaries at the same time and infarcted um, pretty much the whole heart. And this patient died of a massive sudden uh, STEMI. Of course, failure can happen through a dilated cardiomyopathy and then renal infarctions um, and abscesses. This patient has renal abscess. And of course, in right-sided endocarditis, uh, you'll classically see septic emboli to the lung. As we saw, I think we had a, a case of a patient who had a two centimeter uh, vegetation on his uh, ICD lead, and when they went to pull it, he developed a massive PE um, and wound up intubated. He was a 30-year-old IV drug user, so survived that, but um, it was uh, 
I think the second time I'd ever seen a Hampton's hump on x-ray. Um, other complications, of course, uh, there's CNS embolizations and cerebritis. They can get um, arteritis in the CNS and elsewhere leading to mycotic aneurysms uh, as well as vertebral osteo, epidural abscesses, etc. This is patient has a mycotic aneurysm um, in the circle of Willis. So while the skin manifestations are not a, um, obviously have very poor negative predictive value um, for endocarditis, they are helpful um, for helping you quantify the risk of, of uh, complications. So for example, if you do have any peripheral stigmata, it doubles your risk uh, for cerebral emboli approximately from 18 to 32 percent, um, although without a mortality increase. And uh, Janeway lesions in particular are associated with a 75 percent uh, risk of, of extra cerebral emboli other than the Janeway lesion itself, um, compared to 31% of patients without any Janeway lesions. Um, so the uh, peripheral stigmata may still have a prognostic value even if they don't really have a diagnostic value. Um, any questions on those papers before? Okay. So often, um, we run into issues with the guidelines when we're treating um, uh, sort of difficult to treat populations or populations who are at increased risk of complications when we treat them with evidenced uh, courses of therapy. I would say IV drug users are, are, are one group and the other group where I've struggled the most at least is in frail um, patients, usually elderly patients. Um, who can't tolerate surgery. Um, so I, I tried to briefly review uh, the options for these patients who um, aren't uh, sometimes terribly well served by what we have to offer them. Um, one question that comes up all the time with primary teams is, is there any oral option for my IV drug user? And um, or my patient is going to leave the hospital, he won't stay for six weeks or even four weeks, uh, what can I do? So there was a systematic review in 2014 that, that concluded there's, that there was only <coughs> one uh, randomized controlled trial of any quality for oral therapy in, um, in endocarditis. This study was out of Hopkins in, I think, 96. Um, involving about 80 patients, uh, all who were IV drug users, all with uncomplicated right-sided endocarditis. Um, they compared uh, either 28 days of vancomycin or oxacillin, depending on whether they, they were dealing with MSSA or MRSA, to uh, rifampin and Cipro. And they found no difference um, in treatment efficacy. They did find a somewhat higher rate of, of complications um, pick line complications and um, mostly transaminase elevations on oxacillin uh, with the IV regimen. Um, obviously patients had to have Cipro sensitive staph, uh, which is becoming less common now than it was in 96. Um, but this study, um, while it's worth consideration, um, has some important limitations for the real world. Um, it was small, I mean, that's, that's not a fatal flaw, but they didn't require an echo. Um, they said high probability of endocarditis was good enough, so it's not 100% clear that every patient in the study actually had endocarditis. And then the biggest problem I had with it is that they admitted all of the patients anyway. So the patients who got cipro rifampin got directly observed therapy. And if you're going to do directly observe therapy and admit them, then why wouldn't you do the evidence, the more evidence thing, which is just to give them the, the IVs. Um, so I honestly was unable to find any trial of, of oral therapy and endocarditis that would make me feel comfortable releasing an IV drug user into the wild on orals. What IRV do you think will improve such a study as well? Yeah, that's an issue too. 
they actually admitted them for 28 days and then they paid them $145 to stay uh, in some sort of research unit for an additional week so they could get follow-up blood cultures. Um, but yes, <laughs> right, it doesn't really help <laughs> with five weeks of therapy um, or five weeks of an inpatient stay. If you're going to do that, then that's not much of a savings. It's not kind of surprising because like supposedly Cipro is so good for like bacteremia. Is that what we always talk to talk? Like don't use our mm -hmm. fluoroquinolone if you've got a concern about it. question is still unanswered basically. What, what? you're saying? Right. It's one 30 pages each side. Right. We don't know. So we've had to do it yeah. on occasion. Right. It's, it's interesting. We had one two years ago that the guy had gone back and forth between Gainesville and Tampa and had pseudomonas in their providers and would sign himself out of and just flatly refuse stuff. Mm -hmm. Come down to Tampa, he'd admit it, flatly refuse stuff. Some days wouldn't even let you examine. I kept telling the team, get an ethics consult. The guy's not going to let you treat. I don't want mm -hmm. my blood drawn. I don't want my pick in, pull the pick out. Doesn't get drugs for two days. I can't guarantee that this guy is going to be adequately treated. Yep, absolutely. So if he wants to go, can he go on or why not? Right. That, that's what he wanted. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Yep. You yeah. document the hell of that chart and you say, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and you can go back to Gainesville. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good right. I mean, there are certainly patients for whom, you know, something that's not evidence might be the best option that they'll let you give them. Um, another um, study that I thought was sort of innovated in um, from 2010 used these special security seals over the pick lines in selected um, populations. So <laughs> this shows the a security seal over the pick, and there's a separate seal over the infuser, and um, so that they couldn't inject the infuser either with uh, with IV drugs. Um, and the patients underwent a whole lot of counseling, of course, for, in order to get put in the study. They claim that no one in the study abused their pick line. I don't know if. But they went home. Right. They went home. With the seals, right. <laughs> right. I mean, they, they don't claim that no one used IV drugs, gotcha. but they claim that um, <coughs> nobody managed to, right, to use the pick. Um, and they did this through infusion centers. Um, so the security seal option might be something to look into. Um, I've never actually seen it done. I don't know if you don't know. And then if you're a rabbit, there might be some evidence for long-acting um, <laughs> antibiotics. But only, so far, that's only in bunnies. This one is very cute, but it's probably not, um, you know, it would be a lot of money to save your bunny. Um, unfortunately, I found even less evidence in what to do with some of our frail patients who can't um, uh, survive surgery. So. Um, as Dr. Holt pointed out on Friday, in general, when they've looked at surgery versus no surgery or even surgery versus delayed surgery, um, they found a mortality benefit to operating. Um, but it's often a reduced sternotomy, especially in patients with, with prosthetic valves. And now we're even do, doing percutaneous valves in patients who are by definition too frail to undergo surgery, which no doubt are going to get infected um, in, in some of these patients at least. <coughs> Um, so I've personally sent about, I think I've sent two patients to hospice in the last year, one in residency and one in fellowship for prosthetic valve endocarditis. Both have asked me what their prognosis is on oral suppressive therapy after they finish IV antibiotics. And I really was unable to give them any data. I, I was unable to find it. I don't know if anyone here has seen data or has it. And there's always going to be a case report here and there, but there's no right. data. I think that would be right. I think that would be a really helpful um, uh, cohort to do. Not a, not not a randomized control trial, but um, that would be a really helpful chart review just to see what happens to these patients. 
to try to give somebody some idea of what to expect. Um, but even in all comers, so this is data about 10 years ago from Duke, this is in the Duke Collaborative Study, infectious endocarditis was worse than lymphoma. Um, only about half the patients were alive at five years, 40% were still alive at six. When was this data? This is recent data then? This was about 10 years old. Yeah, um, but it's not like things have changed that dramatically in 10 years. It's probably worse now. Um, and even in selected patients who can get the guideline-based care, um, some patients do a lot worse in this curve. Um, so one of the, actually, anyone want to guess what that, what that curve might be for? I showed it to my husband, and he guessed bad, uh, bad side of genetics ALL, and then he decided it was too bad for that. So 20% survival at six years. Um, and this is for dialysis patients who um, get valve replacement surgery for endocarditis. So this is in a population that's healthy enough to get a valve, and there's still only 20% survival at six years. Um, and I lost actually one of my favorite primary care patients last year um, to the to um, intractable bleeding. Um, she had intractable bleeding in her native kidney, um, having survived the endocarditis, and um, for actually longer. She she got she made it seven years, so she beat the odds. Um, but then when they had to hold her um, her anticoagulation, she stroked out. Um, so, um, you know, unfortunately for a lot of these patients, prevention. Um, is both difficult, but um, I think we really need to look more at, at innovative strategies to prevent these patients from getting their valves infected in the first place. It's scary about that. A year and a half, you're at fifty percent. Right. Right. It's horrendous. Right. And even you know, if you make it four years out, the curve is still. It's, it's right. Um, this didn't analyze cause of death, but I think that would be an interesting data as well. Um, so this was all comers. The highest risk uh, patients with staphylococcal endocarditis did worse than this. Patients who had diabetes as their underlying cause of renal failure did did worse. But this was the all comers. Um, so we've talked, we talked a good bit on Friday about um, antibiotics uh, to prophylax endocarditis, especially around procedures, so I won't talk more about that. Um, Florida Hospital, though, has started offering these subcutaneous ICDs, which are interesting. Um, this was just, just last week, they, they started advertising this. Um, so it goes in... Um, the ICD generator kind of goes in your armpit, and then there's a subcutaneous lead that goes over the sternum, which uh, provides more electricity than um, the ones that go into your heart because it needs to get through the sternum. Um, and you can't use these in patients who are pacemaker dependent, who need the ICD for pacemaking functions, but you can use it in patients, say, with long QT syndrome or with heart failure who just need the ICD um, if they don't need the bi pacing. Um, and it, it's a good option. I've, uh, I've referred two patients, not, not in, in Tampa, but in Durham, to get these. Um, I've never had a patient in whom it went off, so I, I don't know as well. It's going to be a jolt. Right. It's going to be a jolt. I hope that you won't be driving. Right. Man, that's going to be a heck of a shock. It's a lot. I, I do understand that it's quite a, um, yes, <laughs> it's quite a thump. Yes. When this thing, <laughs> when this thing discharges. Um, but uh, it certainly is an option uh, for patients who are high risk of getting bacteremias. That doesn't look good. Some leads have been recalled, and we've had to remove them. <laughs> 
But these That's are all true. extravascularly, yeah. so you, then the whole benefit of it is right. Yeah. Right, you don't run the risk of like ventricular rupture yeah. when you yeah. pull these things out. Sort of right. Yeah. Um, so what I took from my um, brief review of, of endocarditis literature is that there's a grave prognosis even in 2015, maybe especially in 2015, based on the, the sort of patients who get endocarditis in the first place. Um, and that we really could use more data, especially in patients who can't get the optimally evidenced therapy. Um, it would be great to look, even retrospectively, at, at um, oral options and outcomes on suppressive therapy for patients who can't get their devices removed, whether it be a pacemaker or a valve. Um, and avoiding endocarditis uh, it seems to be a, a great opportunity for further research, especially as we look at strategies beyond just giving people pills when they get their teeth extracted. Um, and finally, I won't feel bad about getting a TEE.